I'm Rick from Cartex Classic Cars. On this video, it's gonna be all about frame jigs. We're gonna talk about frame jigs, we're gonna build a frame jig, and we're gonna mount a car to a frame jig. I'm gonna show the importance on why I feel frame jigs, for the most part, are a must. If you're doing small, so chassis repairs, you're installing subframe connectors and that's it, or you know, you're cutting small patches where you're not taking the structural integrity of the car and throwing it out the window, you could get away by loading the suspension on a level ground and you know, doing your work there. But when you get to the level that you start really stripping these cars like this Firebird, a frame jig really is a must. I mean, at this point, there's nothing left in this car that if it wasn't for a frame jig, I could push in on this side of the car and fold the whole car. So getting it to its factory measurements where the window is going to fit in all the body panels is going to be really hard. Now when we cut them apart this, uh, this, this much, it also makes it a little bit easier and time it's, it's efficient on our time when we put it back together. So we're not cutting off a small piece, finishing that, and then moving on. You could see we actually got half the parts for the Firebird project um, a couple days ago, actually yesterday. And just getting excited about some parts, I decided to throw the firewall, the Dynacorn firewall in place. You could see it was jigged up. There's these little pinholes down here coming in through the side. So I was able to sit there and just kind of set this firewall in place and really we didn't do anything to it. I just wanted to see what it looked like. And you can see, all in all, the firewall, it's where it's going to be. It moves in and out a little bit. And that's our, we're going to have some adjustability. But we already know the height of this firewall from there to there and everything is right. So that's the idea behind the frame jig and what we're getting for. You know, it's e to make easy parts get put back taking key measurements and jigging up those points so we could just throw parts on there. So we're gonna build basically this frame jig. It's already half built and the reason being, I recorded a bunch of videos, a different intro for this whole segment and the camera kinda erased all the film. It formatted the card. I can't get the videos back. So you're gonna have to trust me what we did and we're gonna fall into this project after this work has already been done. What I initially did was pretty straightforward. I basically have a 10 foot I-beam times two. So what we're looking at, we're looking at 10 feet, 121 inches, both of them. Now, where I got these I-beams and for your frame jigs, you could sit there, I do my frame jig out I-beams. You could do them out of square tubing with a triangle piece in the middle. I've seen frame jigs like that. There's different styles of frame jigs and they all work. The idea is you want a good solid base that's not gonna bend or move when you put a car on it. You want something you could pull off, you want something you could adjust the car and knowing how much you know, this is gonna take the load of the car and be the new structure for the car. How, where I got this, I got this off Facebook Marketplace. It was an industrial company was selling, it was these I-beams were one unit. So it was 22 feet. And what I did, I made a 12 foot frame jig and now we're making what's left on the scrap a 10 foot frame jig. And what I did, I also got these cross pieces with these frame jigs. Uh, so for all this metal to build two frame jigs here, I personally spent $600. It was about a year and a half ago, and I didn't, I didn't build this frame jig until we need it. So I also cut some legs out of it. I'm gonna show you how we're gonna go about installing the levelers. I think every frame jig really needs a leveler put into it because the ground and the, the floor isn't gonna be level. So as we're doing key suspension components and we're building these cars, try to check certain frame height measurements, we wanna make sure everything's level. Even this I-beam, this I-beam right here is uh, nine and a half inches by five inches. So, and it's uh, three eighths inch on top and quarter inch in the center. Um, I'm sorry, five, uh, uh, how big is it? I'm sorry, it's almost half inch. It's probably five sixteenths, but um, 
Yeah, it's actually 5 16 on top, quarter inch in the center of the I-beam. So that I-beam's not gonna move, but you could still, if you pick it up, it's got a little bit of wiggle in it. You could just barely see it. So when we level it out, that's how we get all our four corners. So what we did so far, we basically, you saw, and I actually, if we, if we flip it over, I actually had to cut, grind into the top of this I-beam because we want our penetration on the welder. This is the max um, thickness my welder was able to weld. So if you have a 110 welder, forget what, forget this. This ain't gonna work. But check with your welder settings. You could sit there and put a relief, you know, grind in there to really get good penetration. So we basically cut four, we're four feet wide on this. So the widest part of this frame jig is gonna be four feet. Now, this frame jig is actually upside down right now. I like to build them upside down using the floor as a surface so the bottom isn't welded. We welded all the corners, and then the center piece here is the same as the outside. It's cut a little bit narrower because it's you know cut in the middle of the I-beams, and I welded right around there. So all this is solid. Now, what I did, this is key on the frame jig. You have to make sure the frame jig is square as you're tacking it. Now, not when you weld it, we tacked it and we basically measured corner to corner. So we got 130 and a quarter, and then you're gonna take the same measurement and as you're tacking and before you weld, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna square up your frame jig and make sure you're perfectly square. That's the key to everything, because when you put the car on it, you wanna make sure everything's square so you can take your measurements. We're gonna have to install some casters next. I'm gonna go over what parts I use and as we're installing them. And basically, another thing, we'll go talk about the rest of the frame jigs now. So. You don't have to have, this is a little excessive, these I-beams, they're really big. Um, it works, I mean, I got a great deal on it, but this was our first frame jig right here. We bought this, it's five inches by five inches. Um, I'm sorry, four inches by four inches of frame jig. So this one, we got this and I have gussets in it and you could see for our levelers, we put trailer uh, jacks on the front of it. It still does its function and this frame jig and what I was introduced to frame jigs was actually through race cars. We could sit there and we get a race car and I'll put a, a chassis on the, the jig and what we're trying to do, we get the chassis level and then we come back through and we bend the chassis and we tweak it in certain areas that we want certain drive and everything on these cars. So the frame jig for me was a controlled crooked car basically to give us an advantage while going around one circle. Knowing how much of a advantage it is if we move the car half an inch here, half an inch there on a frame jig you could imagine you when you're building and restoring these cars to this level, you don't want to have a quarter inch, half an inch off on height, wheelbase, or anything else. It could lead to a really ill-driving car. This is currently right now our e-body frame jig. I have a K-member done to it and everything. So this is what we build e-bodies on. So if you have a straight e-body, we do enough of them out here that I could sit there and put an e-body on this car and check it for straightness, build off of it, and we're not building different mounting points. So let's look at the last frame jig we have. And it's really, it's a frame straightener and I'm using it as a jig. So we have this, and actually I got this at a really good deal too, but this is basically a frame, um, pulling machine so we could put arms on the side of this machine and it's used it's an older auto body shop that you could see is professionally built it's about five six thousand pounds we're currently using it as a frame jig but we have the ability to pull cars and straighten cars out here if we have one that comes in a wreck most of the time in the restoration world we're going to replace those panels if they're bent but we have that option in the future and this one has ramps and everything so this is another example of you know the professional version of what we're trying to do it's not going to move anywhere we can adjust it and we could build our cars knowing they're not gonna bend. So now that we kind of wrapped up what we were doing in the thing, let's pick up the project and I'll show you how we get the levelers installed on the frame jig and how I personally have been going about doing them. 
So like I said, the camera did lose all this footage and formatted it, but I did buy a software that was supposed to recover uh, corrupt file systems on uh, cards, SD cards. So we're able to get some of this footage. So this is the process of building the frame jig. The first thing I told you to do, I cut the edges on some of the really thick metal to get a really good penetrating weld. I also removed all the paint that came on the I-beams and the rest of the metal. That's actually another thing that everything here is protected. It's not in bare metal. If you're going to buy this metal brand new, you would have to sit there and you probably should spend the money and get it painted and protected so it doesn't rust on you in the future. Where this one, it came with all the paint and everything. So that saves some money there. So we're using the flat level of the garage floor and we're going to lay this whole frame fixture out. This is exactly how it's going to go. You could add more supports in the middle. You see on our other frame fixture we have four beams total on the short ones. We actually ran out on the metal so this one's going to be only three. We're squaring it up. We're kind of kicking it over and just making sure everything's good. At this point we tacked it all in place while my wife was holding it we checked square and we tacked in enough spots that's not going to move and i added three or four tacks and then kept going with it i'm welding now the whole bottom end of the frame table completely solid what i gotta say is make sure your welder is able to penetrate this anything larger than this this is the largest size my welder is able to weld on a single pass everything else after this my welder says is going to be a multi-pass what i also did i changed my wire size to 035 that's going to allow me to slow down the wire feed a little bit and not overwork the wheel and get more consistent speed because the wire diameter is thicker so you can slow down the wire speed while still feeding the same amount of wire just some helpful tips there about welding all right so now that we got the whole frame jig leveled out and everything secure on the bottom side of it let's go ahead and get the lever legs on so what i got we're going to use these race car or circle track screw jack insert so basically what we got going on this screw jack is gonna you see i, I measure 10 inches out we're gonna take the zerk fitting off we traced it, we're gonna cut it with the plasma and we're gonna drop this screw jack in there. Once it sits in there, when we're done, this 11 inch screw bolt, jack, weight jack bolt, is gonna sit there and it's gonna screw up and down on the screw jack, okay? So this would be the bottom of it. So if we wanna go up 11 inches, it's gonna look like that. We also, the jam nut will actually be on the other side to lock it down, just cause I wanna go lower, uh, raise it up higher, but the jam nut could go on either side. Then I'm gonna have, again, this is all looking upside down how this setting's gonna be. We have this plate, this is gonna be our leg. How the weight jack bolt works is, there's gonna be a bolt through here and this bolt doesn't tighten down all the way. So we want this bolt to have play in it, like that. So basically, as we're screwing the screw jack, the leg can stay straight and we can actually level it just using a half inch ratchet on the top. So that's the idea behind the levelers. We're gonna cut them out, we're gonna drop it in and weld it. So stay tuned, we'll go ahead and do that and we'll come back and then after that, it's time to flip this frame jig over. So the plasma cutter for me is going to be the easiest way to cut this thick metal. This uh, really just cuts it right through. It's got a real precision fine point. So we just outline trace it and you see one tap. It's a perfect circle for the most part as far as much as we can freehand. We'll do the other side and actually all three, all other three corners. And then we'll come back through and we're going to start inserting the weight jack you see I got the Zerk fitting pulled out of the weight jack and notice what I did when installing this weight jack. I got the thick wider side on the outside and the whole frame jig is actually resting on that thick ledge. So what that means is the frame jig, the weld is not holding any pressure. It's keeping the weight jack from spinning. The weight jack itself is set and holding the weight up based on its sheer wider area being on the bottom of it because remember the frame jig is upside down right now if you install this the other way you're basically putting your stress on the weld itself once the weight jack cools down we're going to go ahead and take the actual jack bolt and we're going to screw down right through the bottom and the reason we're doing this we're trying to mark a hole on the top of the frame jig because you see 
the weight jack bolt is longer than the actual I-beam. So we actually are going to have to pr have it protrude through the I-beam and that's going to also allow us to get our ratchet through the top and work the frame jig up and down. Same process, I put some the legs itself underneath so we could protect the concrete, you know, from the sparks hitting down. But besides that, we just, same thing, cut it open. Now we're gonna go ahead and actually install the legs for the final time. We put the Zerk fitting on there. You see I protect it with a little bit of paint. Now we get the weight jack bolt. I'm gonna use some Loctite because you remember this weight jack is gonna be spinning all the time. We're gonna put the bolt through the leg into the bottom of the weight jack bolt. Now this bolt, it doesn't actually hold any pressure of the leg versus the jack bolt. This is basically a guide to keep the weight jack bolt centered on the leg at all times. So when the leg's on the ground, you see the bolt is not really being used unless it has side to side mo movement. So it's just centering up the weight jack bolt on the leg. So now I'm gonna go ahead and you see what I mean with the ratchet, we're coming through, we're lowering the leg so it doesn't stick down as much for when we flip it over. Now. If this is flipped over, you could see how we could get extension in here through the top hole and able to just jack the leg right up. The last thing we're going to do on the bottom of this thing before we flip it over, I'm going to install these casters that I got from Northern Tool. Uh, the part number is at the top 50377 and I went with the 8 inch wide casters because they hold a little bit more weight and you see the other frame jig we had earlier in the video had the 6 inch casters on it. With this one I went with the larger wheels because my lift will be able to get in under it a lot easier and it just, you know, we modify these frame jigs as we go along. You see the evolution of it and I work, I do what works best for me. So if 6 inch wheels are going to work better for you, put 6 inch wheels on it. The 8 inch wheels also hold a little bit more weight so that makes it a little bit better for what I'm trying to do with these frame jigs in the future. I will also say with the casters, you can make mounting plates. You saw I welded them on. It seems like the easy route to go until you need, you bust a caster and then you got to cut it off. So take that with a grain of salt. If you want to spend the time, make some plates and make your frame jig a lot better. This is just a rough idea what's been working for me. So the hardest part about this frame jig, I've done it without this shop crane before, is going to be flipping it over. You see, it's a heavy I beams, I can barely lift one corner of it myself. So really this two ton uh, shop crane really makes life a little bit easier. Just be creative. I used engine hoists in the past. We've done things like that where getting the frame jigs and you have to flip them over because if you think about it, we have to weld both sides. As thick as the metal is, we want this thing to be really strong. So this is how I flipped it over and got it on its four wheels so we can do the final welding on the top of the jig. Rolling it back in the garage, now you can see we started what I showed you in the beginning with our grinding relief cuts. We're going to weld across the top of them. The good thing about putting those cuts in there is the frame jig, it also, the welds won't stick up that much. I mean, the top doesn't have to be a perfectly laser straight. It's not like we're putting plate on the top of it. You can also put plates on the top of these things to make them even more durable and just get a flat plane surface, but the cost goes up even higher then. This is the 74 Cuda where I mounted a frame jig today. When the car came, it had these stands with some casters on it that the owner was not really, he didn't care about, he didn't like it. It was just put the car on it, get it out the door. I asked him if I can cut them up and make mounting this car to the jig easier and he said go ahead. They're not 100% straight, but what I did, I made sure I cut the same distance from the top of the frame in the front and back down and to give us, make sure the car is gonna hold up the same amount at all four corners. Now what we end up doing, I go around to the frame jig and I'm leveling out the frame jig. All four corners, every which way we can, we want this frame jig to be level so when we drop the car, which our mounts are the same length, going to the same frame locations that are bolted in this car, that all those will be completely level. So now that we're screwing it up, actually I'm bringing the frame jig up and kind of just lifting the front end off of this car 
off the lift that was only an eighth of an inch down. Then we're going to go around to all four corners of this car and drop a plumb bob and just measure off. You could see I picked the same frame measurements on both sides. And now this is just to get the frame jig squared under the car. We got to go back through before we weld this car and check multiple locations to know we're squared and centered. But nothing's welded on here. So I'm checking both sides. I'm measuring it. I showed you what I was checking with the tape measure. And then I basically take a sledgehammer now. The car's not loaded on the frame jig and we're just tapping it over. Just ever so slightly moving in an eighth of an inch at a time and rechecking. We do all four corners of this car before we weld it up. And you can see, that's what I also like about having a heavier frame jig, is you, when you tap it, it doesn't move too much. So I'm only moving this a 16 inch at a time. I know about how hard I hit, how hard it has to move. Now that we got the front done, we'll go ahead and we're going to do the back. You could see the back's not even on the frame jig at this point. It's still sitting on the lift. We're going to ease this car down once I get it centered, and then we're going to check it again. It's just easier to do that because we don't want the front to get knocked out of proportion while we're adjusting the back. And you could see we were off about a quarter inch in the back. So once we get straightened down, I'm actually going off two main chassis screw holes for bump stops on the rear end so those are squared up locations that's something you need to make sure you need to pick something on both sides of the frame rails an important part of the car that is structural that isn't going to move that matches once we know all four corners are set we'll go ahead and drop down the car i'm going to tack the four corners on and what i did i just did the front right now what i did you saw i dropped the back on there and now i'm going to go through recheck my squareness checking my frame heights everything else making sure nothing moved while we drop the lift down the main thing i like to also do i like to make sure the rockers are completely level before we go ahead and weld this thing up solid all right, so wrapping up the video with the 74 CUDA on the frame jig. I showed you how to build the frame jig, how to mount a car on the frame jig. We're gonna just wrap this up. I'm gonna show you some other tips and tricks on what we're trying to do right now. So you see everything squared off first. Um, the CUDA, this CUDA came to us as it arrived Pretty much as you see, I took the doors off, I took some unbolting stuff off, the back end of the car was already cut off, it's missing some wheel houses on the other side. So basically what I'm doing on this car, I, this car could have been on a longer jig, I could have been on my e-body jig, but basically I was kind of unsure because before the car showed up here whether or not it needed to, because this car's got subframe connectors in it, but the owner just wasn't happy with the work that was done on it. And on his defense, I kind of agree with him. Um, it's not bad or malicious work, it's just not the, the quality he wanted the car at. So if you've seen this car, I mean, I'm not gonna put any shops names out there or anything, please don't say it on this channel either. I don't want to badmouth the shop. Again, I don't think the work is that bad, um, but we're going to clean it up a little bit more and finish off the work. There's probably not going to be a lot of filming done on this car itself, minus this jig video. The owner's really awesome and he was open for the filming. But again, since it's not really my work and not the steps that we would have taken um, in doing this process, we'll probably kind of just do this and maybe post some pictures on our Facebook page. So where we're at, um, we got the 74 like you said we have the frame measurement chart so now that everything's level on this frame jig we need to go through especially since the we're kind of unsure how the car was built and how the subframe connectors were welded in so we need to take the 74 e-body frame measurement chart and go through this car front to back and verify our measurements now maybe someone um, out there in YouTube land can tell me because I haven't figured it out yet so we have the frame measurements to 71 to 73 CUDAs now we have the frame measurements for 74 CUDA and we look right here on our front wheelbase both cars the total wheelbase is 108 inches so this front section from this K member bolt to the end of the frame rail is measuring as I check it the same with the tram gauge now, the same measurement as the 71 to 73 cars. 
Um, if you look at AMD, their frame rails, 71 to 74, are the same frame rails. Same thing with the torsion bar cross member. Now, I know you have to use, it's a 70 or 71 torsion bar cross member, and you use the, um, the center transmission mount for that corresponding 71 car on the 72 to 74. But I'm not quite sure what the difference is on the chassis measurements. I mean, I'm looking at them here, but my measurements aren't crossing up. So I'm gonna do a little more research on it. If anyone out there is an expert on the 74, CUDAs. Um, this is the first one I've had in the shop. We've done multiple other e-bodies, but like I said, this is the first one, so I'm going to dig into it a little bit more. Like I said, we just got on the frame jig. We got it squared up, and I'm going to double check our height measurements, front and rear. We're going to follow the whole Danum line and all the the Mopar e-body measurements. I got two other e-bodies here in the shop that we can verify off of, and I'm gonna try to figure it out for myself, but maybe some out there save me some time. So we got our adjusters, we got them locked down. Like I said, everything here is level. We're gonna take our front to rear height measurements. Also, check this out. I know it's not really related to the frame jig, but it's just cars in general, the door, um, the door hinges, we pulled them off. This car really has never been apart, and it's kind of cool. I mean, it's kind of scary at the same time to see that Mopar has bare metal. They don't prep these cars. They don't prime a lot of spots. A lot of times you'll see under the drip rails and everything else on the panels or where the seam sealer is. They put the seam sealer on and it's rusting under the seam sealer. So a lot of these cars are survivor cars. Everyone says, oh no, it looks good. Or the cars that have pretty paint. Unless you really strip them down, there's a lot of rust that is showing up. And that's where we talked about with the owner that we started looking at this car. And even though it had a lot of work to it, we're going to sandblast some of the car back here. We also are going to remove in the rest of the trunk and area on this um, e-body car. You could see what I did down here. I had to make and extend on my frame jig mount. So be aware, you might have to do this too. Obviously our frame jig stopped here. So what I did, I took the scrap, what was left over from the rest of the pieces. I extended it out and this is my e-body jig that came off the other jig I, that was sitting over here. I showed you in the earlier part of the video with the Challenger on. So the, we didn't need this part on there anymore. And this is verifying that the rear frame rails, everything is the right length and distance apart, which I kind of figured. But so we were able to put that on there and modify it for this jig right here. I didn't want to cut it in and cut these bars because when I take this back off, this will bolt back into that other e-body jig and fit perfect. So I really hope this video helped you in wrapping up on frame jigs in general. Um, I really feel that if you're gonna do major structural repairs, for instance, we're gonna cut the whole back of this car off minus the two frame rails. We wanna know when we're done and when we're putting the new parts on and as we're sandblasting, these frame rails aren't gonna move. This back panel isn't gonna lift up and down. And that's the key here. That's the whole point of the frame jig that when we start cutting stuff apart, the frame jig itself takes the structure. So. Thank you for sticking along on this video. I really hope it helped. I, I really hope that, I think people hear frame jig and they think they need some major custom built, you know, chassis setup that's all high end. You could take something as simple as some I-beams, some square tubing, build a structure that's not gonna bend or twist for the most part, that's gonna support your car and make it mobile in the long run. Try to put levelers on it. Try to get it where that car is a flat chassis table. And when you cut it apart, you build it on here. I would say a lot of people say, well, I can't work from underneath the car with the frame jig. That's why I want to work on the rotisserie. Saying that most of the parts that we do in this shop, I usually build, the cars are built with the frame rails first and we're kind of working our way on the top. I'm always working on top of the car. So get the car done, then if you want, put it on the rotisserie when you're done. Then clean up your welds and address a couple other welding issues underneath the car. But get most of your chassis work and everything together with the car and the frame jig. So thank you again for liking our videos, subscribing to our channel, and sticking along. We're gonna put out more and more content. You know, we got some builds coming up and everything else, so stay tuned for that. I'm Rick for Cartage Classic Cars, and we'll see you in the next video.